every once in a while, a comment made by someone has a profound impact on our lives. And in one of those rare instances for me, a comment came from a student of mine in a chemistry recitation session. I was standing at the chalkboard discussing some unsolved problem in physical chemistry. I think it had something to do with photosynthesis. And one of my bright young female students in the back of the classroom raised her hand and says, but Mr. Lindsay, I thought everything was understood in chemistry. Now this, this comment really surprised me and shocked me. Could it be that they actually believed that humans had the ability to understand all of chemistry? And so I polled a variety of the students in my classroom and realized that her thoughts weren't unusual and that this was a belief shared by many of the students in the class. And this was the University of Chicago, some of the brightest uh, students we have in this country. How could this be? Doing an experiment that's never been done before or understanding a phenomenon that was previously inexplicable is what inspires us as scientists. Failing to convey that to students is a missed opportunity. After all, science can be a little difficult. It, it requires analytical, creative, critical, and often abstract thinking. And it tends to emphasize understanding a subject as opposed to simply knowing a subject. So it was this experience that really made me realize that there's something terribly wrong in the way that we're preparing our future scientists. The, when we don't convey the very thing that motivates us to our best and brightest students, these are the students that are going to be our future leaders, our future leading scientists, technologists, engineers, mathematicians, you know, the so-called STEM leaders. And so this realization sent me on a crusade to think deeply, to reflect. That's the theme today. To reflect on what it is that motivates me, inspires us as scientists, fascinates us about the work we do. Because we have to admit, this, this work isn't entirely easy. It isn't what most people call a good time. A scientist dressed up in a lab coat with goggles and gloves isn't considered sexy. And working through a 15-page uh, derivation of mathematical gibberish isn't exactly what one calls captivating reading. So what is it that motivates us into it? There are certainly easier ways to make a living. So then, what is it that drives us? Well, some are, pure, some are really driven by the possible outcomes of the work that we're doing. I'm studying cancer so that I might save someone's life someday. Or I'm studying new metallic alloys to make stronger, more durable steels which might make safer automobiles. Or I'm going to study this new nanofabrication technique so I can make smaller, more powerful uh, electronic gadgets. And so on. And that's all great. And that's important. And some youth are motivated by the relevance, the practicality of the application. Others are motivated by the simple act of overcoming a technical challenge. I liken it to the enjoyment that you get when you solve a complex crossword puzzle. Like overcoming an obstacle or persevering where others may not have succeeded in the past. The thrill of the victory. You know, perhaps this is a little bit of that innate uh, hunter-gatherer instinct revealing itself. But I think there is a great motivation that's often forgotten or overlooked. A natural motivation in the beauty of the discovery. I'm talking about the innate beauty in the act of discovering itself. Now, I know some of you are thinking, this guy's a real geek if he can think of, see a bubbling green beaker of liquid is beautiful. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm talking about is that sense of pleasure, that sense of wonderment, and a deep appreciation that a scientist feels when they uncover new data for the first time or they discover some uncharted territory, or they see a relationship between things where you didn't expect it. The innate pleasure and, and beauty in the discovery itself. Now, understanding this phenomenon isn't very easy because the concept of beauty is not very easy to understand. It's like many other things where it's difficult to define, but you kind of know it when you see it. Well, the good news is there are people much smarter than me who have studied this sort of thing. And like many human traits, it comes in two types. There's what I like to call 
natural beauty, that is, things that we are instinctually attracted to or appreciate, and then there's what I call nurtured beauty, things that we are taught to appreciate or be attracted to. We, we hear from an early age that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and clearly that's true to some extent. We are all influenced by our families, our peers, our cultures, and our exposures. We see the world around us through filters that are shaped by our individual experiences. Our likes and dislikes aren't only generated from our sensing of an object, but by our relationship with that object. So take, for example, this picture, a plate full of strawberry pancakes. Now, some of you I know are thinking, that is a work of sheer beauty, right? To me, I can't palate the thought of this thing. Sure, I love pancakes. I love strawberries, and who does not like whipped cream? But together, they trigger a response that is quite repulsive to me. See, when I was a child, I went to a restaurant, and I had a plate of pancakes just like this, and I got a little sick. Well, really sick. Take my word for it, it was pretty awful. And that experience has biased me away from this ever since. We all have experiences and impressions in life, some positive, some negative, and those experiences, impressions, bias our response to beauty. We all have preferences that influence the way we view the world around us. But I want to emphasize that there are also preferences that are programmed deep within us, deep within our genetic being, a natural sense of what beauty is. And I think this was best described by philosopher Dennis Dutton, who says that beauty is a Darwinian response to natural selection, buried deep within our brains and our genes. We are naturally attracted to certain people, objects, and environments that exude health, vitality, fertility, and excellence. Anthropologist Don Simons from UC Santa Barbara also added that beauty isn't whimsical. Beauty has meaning, and beauty serves a function. If you ask a group of people to identify attractive faces in a large set of uh, pictures of, of faces, there tend to be certain universal traits in the choices that they make. Attractive faces across all cultures tend to be symmetrical, and they tend to be well-proportioned. Now, we all know that this was recognized over 500 years ago by uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So indeed, researchers have shown that human symmetry is well correlated with quote-unquote healthy genes and physical fitness. Uh, so it seems that we are all influenced by these deep impressions of the relationships between things. There also appear to be other relationships that are ingrained deep within our brains. Take, for instance, the golden ratio. It's the number 1.618. The golden ratio is a mysterious number where the ratio of two lengths is the same as the length, the ratio of the total to the larger of the two. The golden ratio is a number that seems to also be ingrained deep within us. So on the screen, I have what I'll call the most pleasing rectangle. It's a rectangle for which the ratio of the length to width is the golden ratio. Now, I know you're all thinking, that's one attractive rectangle. <laughs> well, the ancient Greeks were the first to recognize this relationship. And you see the golden ratio in many of the designs. It's thoroughly throughout the design of the Parthenon, and you see it through Greek culture. Well, it also is something that we sense deeply within us. It's found all around us in our mathematics, it's in our art, it's in our architecture, and it also happens to be a ratio that we judge as attractive at the proportions of various components of our face. There are also other types of symmetry. Uh, relationships isn't limited to our visual faculties. It's also present in our other senses. We can, we can sense relationships and interactions and complex patterns in the food we eat, whether it's the beauty of a fine wine, or the ugliness that we taste in rancid meat. We can also hear beauty. A string of notes is pleasing to the ear, and it's immediately clear when a harmonious chord is played. 
What's interesting is that harmony is a subconscious recognition of the ratio and relative values of the frequencies. For instance, a harmonious major chord has frequency ratios of the notes of four to five to six, whereas a slightly less pleasing minor chord is 10 to 12 to 15, and even less harmonious numbers or uh, uh, notes are even higher. Isn't it fascinating how we have the subconscious understanding of the relationship between different things? And so it seems that beauty to us is a sense of relationships, of symmetry, of proportion, and of harmony. And some of you may recognize that those three ideas are three of the basic nine principles of art. You know those things you learned back in high school? Remember, unity, variety, harmony, emphasis, eye movement, balance, pattern, rhythm, and proportion. And so it seems that beauty is defined deep within us at a genetic level. It's a sense of the relationship between things. It's all around us, and somehow we get a sense of enjoyment from it. There's this quote that's uh, well-known that describes a scientist. Scientists are people who learn more and more about less and less until they know everything there is to know about nothing. And I'm sure that some of you know people that uh, follow that stereotype. I happen to work with a few of them. <laughs> but I think the most important discoveries are not those that are done by cataloging the intricate details of an organism or measuring some physical phenomenon to higher level precision. The most meaningful discoveries are those that uncover patterns in data that were not expected, that sense relationship between things that were previously uncovered. Those are the concepts of meaningful relationships. And they also happen to be the same exact principles that appeal to our direct ideas of the aesthetic. The principles of art are around, all around us. They're in our physics, they're in our chemistry, they're in our biology, they're in astronomy, they're all around us. Take, for instance, the principle of symmetry. Symmetry plays a profound role in all of the laws of nature and all of the laws of physics. The interesting and fascinating patterns observed in the leaves of plants are all around us. And then it's remarkable the degree of high degree of symmetry in every unique snowflake. Symmetry is all around us. Take another principle, unity. Some of the most profound discoveries in all of science are done when you take one phenomenon and can relate it to some other discipline and unify them into a, simple, a single understanding. One of my favorite examples is uh, back in the 18th century, or 19th century, electricity and magnetism were thought to be two completely different phenomena. And in 1820, Hans Christian Norsted, completely by surprise, completely accidentally, was preparing a lecture and he noticed the deflection of a compass needle when he was passing electricity through a nearby wire. That simple observation led to the unification of electromagnetism, which is one of the most profound discoveries in all of humankind. And today, the greatest minds in the world are working on a grand unification theory for all of the fundamental forces around us. These are just a couple of examples of how the principles of art are all around us, and they influence our assessment of beauty, and they happen to also be the main principles that lead to scientific discovery. Science is beautiful. In fact, we are genetically predisposed to see its beauty. We just have to be learn trained to learn to see it for ourselves. So do I think this is something that we can teach others? Absolutely. If we can teach an appreciation for art through the principles of art, then we can do the same for science. They're the same things. Maybe then we can share with them the beauty of discovery. What we can do is teach them the principles of art. We can share with them the discoveries of that which is elegant, like the ability of a lotus leaf to shed water, or of that which is clever, like the Euler's equation. Or what's remarkable, for instance, looking at something familiar and then revisiting it from a dis different perspective and getting a very different interpretation of what's going on. Then, maybe then, we can teach others to cherish and savor the beauty that's implicit in our science, instead of getting overwhelmed by the technical jargon and complexity. 
in a world where we're easily overwhelmed by complexity. It's the interactions and the relationships between things that are most meaningful and pleasurable. And few experiences in life are as rewarding as being fir the first to observe or realize them. I believe that teaching and, ex and experiencing this beauty of science with our children is an often neglected but absolutely critical component to raising our, our future scientists. And by sharing with them this beauty, I think we can inspire them and we can help train the next generation of great thinkers, discoverers, innovators, and inventors.